We come now to the first episode of a four-part science fiction serial based on a character created by, in the Eagle comic 40 years ago, Dan Dare. La commissione del popolo deve avere il suo rapporto, colonnello Dare. Der Bericht ist wichtig, größter Eil. Captain Dare, nous félicitations. Le besoin d'un rapport comprehensif, nous voudrions attirer l'attention des Nations Unies. the attention of the United Nations, the heroism of Major Pierre Lafayette. The pilot Captain Hank Hogan will file his report immediately to you, Colonel Dare. Let us have a full update soonest. We have work to do. The message is loud and clear, Colonel Dare. A full report, and the PM asked me to tell you, well done. So full citrep, evaluation, everything. Do my best, Sir Hubert. Dan Dare. Pilot of the future. Dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Part one, disaster. Tape coded AK-37RBG-1. This is the official log and report of the Ranger mission... All sources will be identified by code and a full list of sources will be attached. Crew will identify themselves. Henry Brennan Hogan, pilot captain, born in Houston, trained photographer, racing driver and navigator, USAF, seconded to the mission out of a secret base somewhere in the British Isles. Pilot Major Pierre-Auguste Lafayette, analytical mathematician, three-dimensional physics, French space service. Spaceman, class one. Albert Dick. Oh, do I have to use my full name, sir? Sorry. Albert Fitzwilliam Digby, born Wigan, married, volunteered Ranger Mission. I hate these gadgets, sir. Dare, Daniel, Colonel, British European Space Service, leader. Professor Peabody did not submit an ident tape at this time. We will insert it when it arrives. The report will contain all relevant material. I will interrupt the flow for matters of clarification. It began in the early spring. Here at the space launch site, tension rises. The hopes of the Kingfisher crew and of their families and comrades, indeed of the whole world, depend on success. Earlier today, I managed to snatch an interview with Colonel Dare, who is overseeing launch preparations. We all know that the hopes of the world ride on the Kingfisher. Success means that the world will be able to feed its teeming millions. (laughs) Next background tape logged at A47BK1. The agronomists, economists and the other experts are predicting worldwide famine if no new cultivable areas are found out in deep space. Failure will mean disaster. The countdown continues. Kingfisher, Kingfisher, do you hear us? Over. Loud and clear, control. We're ready to go. Checks complete. We are ready and counting. All systems green. Ready to go, Sir Hubert. Wish her luck. This is it. Goodbye, Kingfisher. Best of luck. Thank you. We have liftoff, gentlemen. You you wanted to go down. Promise me one thing, Sir Hubert. If they fail, for whatever the reason, promise me I go on the next probe. It must not fail. We can't afford another failure. A week later, Digby was serving up my breakfast. Shall I turn the ticker news off, sir? Breakfast is ready. Good chap. Don't tell me bacon, eggs, hot toast. Eh, hey, no, but them vitamin blocks again. Yeah. Queer do, isn't it, sir? Vitamin blocks. I tell you, my Auntie Anastasia has had 40 fits of... She'll be you. having them too, Digby. Nay, hey, sir, not up in Lancashire. Still a few pigs hidden in the back, no doubt. And a few hens left a lane. Hey, hey, I could ask her to send a dozen... No, of... thank you, Digby. I'd rather not know about your formidable aunt's black market activities. Uh, just thought I'd happen to cheer you up, sir. You've had a face like Fulton since Kingfisher left. Mm. No one's been to Venus before, have they, sir? Digby! Colonel Dare's residence, he's Colonel just... Colonel Dare to report to headquarters immediately. My Colonel cap, Dare's Digby! Hurry, man, get the jeep jets! I don't know what the hurry is, I'm sure. At any moment, Kingfisher will be arriving at the point where the other ships disappear, Digby. So step on it! 
Kingfisher bearing ZN 76 AL34. Cross bearing from Moonpix XC51 MT. We had our first view of the Kingfisher from the external orbiting cameras. Activated. She looked in good shape. Give me voice contact with Captain Crane. I can hear him, but we can't seem to get through to him, sir. Switch from headphone to speaker contact. This is the critical time. We have a firm bearing, Captain Crane. Good. Three hours to touchdown. Just approaching the dead zone, sir. Dead zone? What the lads call it, sir. Sort of graveyard, sir. We'll be through it in ten parsecs. What the... What's that? Check vents. Check all systems. Impulse cylinders, sir. Impulse cylinders. I have no power. My controls are dead, sir. All crew, all crew, hear this, hear this. Impulse cylinders gone. Stop jets. Seal five, seven, and eight bulkheads. Break out emergency oxygen and pressure suits. Fire, sir! Fire! Kingfisher's mission ended there, in the graveyard three hours from Venus. The usual emergency meetings happened, of course. I was piloting the jeep jet to the first of them when the beginnings of an idea struck me. Ironical, it seems to me, sir. Really, Digby? Step on it, Dan. Sir. The yeah, haste to be kept waiting. A world government ends wars, doctors get all the diseases taped, poverty's more or less gone, everything in the garden's lovely, except... There's now to eat in it. Well, it's bound to happen. Population doubles and redoubles, takes up farming land. What's left has been exhausted by bad farming, can't grow enough food, and so chaos. That's why Venus was so important, possible farming land. I think I know what happened to Kingfisher, sir. Huh? This new class of ship works off impulse wave engines. So? These waves, bounced off the moon, are picked up by the in-flight airships. Yes. Picked up by the cylinders. Well, go on. Say a shield were erected to prevent those rays getting to the ship. Well, they wouldn't have a chance, but who... How? Where? Don't know until we go and see. Do I, Sir Hubert? Go, Dan. Go, Sir Hubert. We have a plan, Prime Minister. We need money and manpower and we need permission. And courage. Oh, very well. Carry on, gentlemen. Well, no need to wait on ceremony. Carry on. Old-fashioned rocket ships. Rockets went out with the ark, Sir Hubert. Dreadful things. Build one soonest, understand? And three two-man shuttles to Colonel Dare's design. It's important it has no impulse methodology. No impulse? You're mad, Colonel. Rebuild one of the early models. Down here at Space HQ, there is a scene of frantic activity as Colonel Dare supervises the rebuilding of a spaceship that seems to have come from the old museum in London. This may be the last hope for the world. There have been riots in Jakarta and on the western seaboard of America. A news we blackout... We are running out of time! She's ready for testing. Three months from start to finish. I hear you got a new crew joining. <laughs> Is there no way to keep a secret here? <laughs> Not about the Ranger. No, sir. She is a beauty. A beauty, Sir Hubert. I trained on one of these shuttles, oh, way back. You want to give the personal <laughs> rocket vehicle a trial run? <laughs> I cleared it with control. Ignition. Adjust the throttle. And away we go. Tally ho! Meanwhile, in the control tower. Well, I'll be gall darn if I ever saw anything like that outside a Houston museum. Man, amazing. I have never in my life to think men risk their lives in such burn shakers. <laughs> you two for Colonel Dare? That's right. He around? He must be laughing fit to bust seeing that old crate doing a fly past. Uh, up in he might. You'll see on the landing area. Jump on jets! That crate landed! I have a nasty feeling, my friend. You know this day? Flown with him. Hell of a pilot. Hell of a good pilot. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Dan! What are you doing in that thing? Flying it, Hank. I have a very nasty feeling. What gives, Dan? I explained everything to them, and... Venus? No chance! 
Oh, for your little trolleys, boys. A suicide ride. I promised my little wife no trouble. No adventures, no risk, no insurance. Your wife? Second wife. You'd like her, Dan. Hold on, I got a couple of three Ds. I have more important things to think about, Hank, than wives. You coming to Venus or not? Of course he will come. We are honored. Thank you, Pierre. Hank? She'll never forget you. Okay. We waited in the mess for the last member of the party. Professor Peabody is usually on time, I understand. Hmm. Some bumbling old daughter. Remember that trip we did to Alpha Mega Sorry, Dan, when we took that prof along? He was a damn nuisance. Well, I'm assured by personnel that the professor comes with the highest of recommendations. Sir Hubert, Colonel Dare. Professor Peabody reporting rather late. Sorry. Had to hand over a rather oh, complex woman? experiment on atmospheric Cats. pollution and oh, pollen yeah. cards from an assistant. I say. Gentlemen, you want a geologist, botanist and agriculturalist. I am all those. You wish to check my credentials? Uh, no. Uh, merci, mademoiselle. It is uh, that we are discussing a uh, dangerous, uh, near enough suicidal flight, and we had no thoughts of women on such a mission. Uh, we are sure you are a good scientist. Women in space. Damn it all. The PM's private line. I am also a qualified space pilot. Uh, what do you do in your spare time, Pro? I'm a world expert on orchids. Oh. Prime Minister, Professor Peabody has just arrived. A we... But an order from the... Oh, yes, 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 sir, of course, sir. Women! Ah. A week later, we were ready to leave for the planet Venus. Systems locked. Hank, okay? Seven, four, Tape. three, Recording. zero and holding. Hi, Colonel. All going well. Basic check's nearly done. And Pierre? All doors and hatches Chef, sealed. Absorbers work. regretted. Takeoff procedures counting down. Run on, chaps. Where's the professor? <laughs> Tell him Sir Hubert some home truth. I flatly refuse. Oh, I'm younger, I am fitter, oh. and I have been flying mm -hmm. more recently, Sir Hubert. Your flying log is, if you want the truth, out of date. It can't be. I checked Cylinder. your accreditation. Check. You know the rule, sir. Artillery. I fly the shuttle when the Accurate. time comes. Places for takeoff. Places for takeoff. Places for takeoff. Check all systems. All off hold. All systems go. Retroactors in place. Seven, four, activated. Good luck. left planet Earth on the 15th of July and three weeks later were approaching what had become known as the Graveyard. Each dead ship had left a transponder giving out its call sign to be picked up by any approaching craft. We were kitted up in our space exploration suits and ready to get away from the orbiting mother craft in the space shuttles. Look all right, do I, sir? That parachute doesn't do much for your figure, Dig, but you'll do. Are you sure you can handle the shuttle, Mr... Oh, no, sir. Rocket Shuttle 4, Peabody and Sir Hubert, ready. Thank you, Professor. Number 3, Lafayette and Ogan, ready to go. Thank you, Pierre. Ranger, we're leaving you now. Good luck, everyone. Uh, you, you, you. You. We approached what was left of Kingfisher. It lay about 50 parsecs to 15 degrees of our course. A mass of twisted tubes, buckled metal plates, lying like a great whale in the huge wheel of space. The plan was simple, direct, and required only cold nerve, courage, and heroism. It was not something any Frenchman would have turned away from, of course. Colonel Dare insisted that he should be the one to take the first risk, to go through the shield. It was a bit warm in the shuttle as the Colonel put his foot down. I thought then, I thought, up and my auntie would have a bit of a turn if you could see me now. E, our Arthur, she'd say, E. By Ecky Thump. Near the danger zone now, Dig. Three and four, this is your leader. We're going in now. Good luck, sir. It was all going well. Past the hulk of Kingfisher and leaving her transponders behind. The radio, sir. Blown up. I should have remembered. The radio works on impulse waves. We can't even warn the others. There's fire, sir. And the plates all down one side are buckled and straining. Hold on, Dick. Hold on. <laughs> sir, atmosphere warning. We've hit the air round Venus, sir. Yippee, we can bail out of the old Keitel hole together while we slow down. 
we seem to be in a spot of trouble at this time. Four to command ship. Colonel Dare has a malfunction. Over. Hey, Dan. Come in, Dan. Sir Hubert to Major Lafayette. Hold your station. Sit rep soonest. Oh, Jimmy, sit down. Stiff up a lip about it. He's out of control. Dan Dare. Come in, please. Come in. Dan Dare. Come in. Tell that old stuff shirt we're going in after. That old stuff shirt will tell you when and if you do anything. Repeat. Hold your station. Seem to be on fire again, sir. Up and we're in a spot of bother. You're a tonic, Digby. Anyone tell you? Ah, my auntie once said... Later. That if that fire reaches us, we're dead anyway. Fasten helmets. You ready to abandon ship? Right, sir. Got your PG pistol, sir. No time to pack anything else, sir. Here goes. Jump, Digby! Suspended from our parachutes, we activated our personal black boxes so that everything would be recorded. Speech, physical condition, and ambient sounds. Grand. Venus at last. No ship, no radio, no food, no doubt. Why I ever joined the space fleet, I'll never know. I lost sight of Digby as he drifted towards the craggy mountains to the west. I was coming in too fast, thinner atmosphere. Directly below was a lake. Get rid of the chute! Quick, quick! Here we go! Here we go! Water. Felt like water. Looked like... like purple soup. And fish. So it sustained life. That was something. Oh, boy. Oh, will you look at... trouble! It's a... A huge sludge green sea monster. It's it's fast. No! Meanwhile, Pierre, this is very dangerous. We knew the danger when we volunteered, so you bet. There has been no contact. We must go into the zone. He's not going to let us. The old... Ten minutes, Pierre. You have ten minutes, and then we will follow. Keep radio channels open at all times. What's he singing, Sir Hubert? An old song, Miss Peabody, a French rallying cry, an anthem, they used to call it. What? Pierre! Come in, Pierre! I'd stopped just before entering the zone. I knew suddenly what the problem was. The radio, Hank! What? Help me! What the hell are you doing? We need the radio, for heaven's sake, man! It will kill us! It works off impulse rays, just like the new ships. We have to jettison it. Good man! Oh, you're an old rattler, you are. A real genius. You better warn Sir Hubert. Where are you? Here! Yeah. Ship three to Le Control, over. Where the blue places? The radio, sir. The radio works off impulse rays. We have to remove it before we go through the barrier. Over. Oh, well done, Pierre. Very good. Jettison the radio and good luck. We will follow you down. Out. Meanwhile... Hey, that were a right welcome for Colonel Dare and no mistake. Up the top of a cliff and looking out, I could see and I could hear. Why, it were chilling that noise. Nasty, messy place, Venus. Funny water. The colour of me Auntie Anastasia's favourite Auntie Macassar. Like mud at Wigan on a wet day. Captain Dare was out there in the middle of the lake, giving that thing a right hammering. No way to welcome guests, you... you refugee from Loch Ness. I'll have to put you to sleep, old friend. Thank heaven Dig remembered the paralyzing pistol. Now, get ashore and sort out the mess. Sir, are you all right, sir? Fine, Dick. How about you? Oh, uh, fair to middling, sir. Oh, bit of a nasty go out there, sir. Oh, I don't see any bus stops, sir. No snack bars, for that matter. Nor any What next? To... Is that what you mean? Uh, in a word, sir, yes. We had an RV planned if one of the other ships got through. Oh, I see, sir. Great, sir. 
And how do we get to this RV? The coordinates are locked into the infrared compass, all ready to go. All we have to do is follow the bearings. Oh, uh, across the lake? Is that all, sir? Crossing the lake was easy. We built a small raft, set up a chute, a sail, and as the prevailing wind seemed to be in our favour, it took little time to cross the purple lake. Not a sign of our antediluve, our old friend neither. Time for us to die? Trust you, dig a completely unexplored planet, and what do you do? Go to sleep. I'm conserving energy, as it happens. Eventually we arrived on the far side of the lake. The atmosphere was dangerous, but we were breathing through the intake converters in our helmets. We had removed our spacesuits. Land ho, we're there. Strange, towering cliff and pillars of shining red stone. Caves and terraces of black basaltic rocks carved by millions of years of sea and wind action. Shanks's pony now, Dick. I don't like the look of this gully, sir. Now them boulders up there. Look out, sir! You think we want it here, sir? Just keep an eye open. Uh, Yes, sir. We climbed through the rocks and away from the lake until... Look at that, sir. It's carved, sir. A huge pillar. Never natural light, Colonel. And look, there's a cave behind it, sir. Like it was a gateway or something. We'll take a look, Dick. Careful now. You ever get the feeling that you're being watched? Like eyes all over the... Shush, Dick. Look at these. Shine the torch here. You see? Marks. Paintings, Dick. The work of intelligent beings. You see this one here? Looks very like a man. And and this, very much like ancient Egyptian art, Dick. Dick? Dick me! Don't look now, sir. But I think we've been followed by what looked like a bunch of overgrown blue bottles. There were maybe 20 of them. Tall, humanoid, blue-skinned. They wore helmets over bulging foreheads, long yellow skirts and breastplates that looked like silver and gold. For a moment, nothing moved. They were crouched behind their gun shields. I'll check him out, sir. Don't shoot, Dig. I'll talk to them. Don't be daft, sir. Talk to a bunch of heathens. You'll be famous last words, sir. They won't even appreciate it. Stop nattering. Keep me covered. Nathan! Oh, you murderous butcher! I'll get you for that! Here goes! Ah, that showed him! Colonel? Colonel Dare! I'm all right, Digby. Just stunned. We looked over at the figures paralysed by Digby. They were virtually human. But I saw no point in waiting to do further research on these hostile blue men. We walked out of the caves and saw across the valley a vast transporter. It was lit by strobing lights and little winking bulbs. Wow! Like Blackpool, South Shore, when I was a kiddie. And we walked right into the trap. Look out, Digby, behind you on the ledge! Oh, hey! Hey! Get off, you great blue horror! Get off! Sir! Give up, Dig! Don't fight him without numbers! We were marched across the valley to the flashing transporter. They stuck us on top. It climbed to a great cliff and then turned on full power and it straight for the purple lake. What happens if the brakes fail, sir? Hang on. It had taken us hours to cross the lake. It took the Venusian machine less than 20 Earth minutes to speed over the surface. We arrived at a vast ramp leading to huge green and yellow pillars. Domes glinted under the watery light of the sun. The whole city, for it was a city, hummed. The blue men took us under guard into a huge inner chamber and ripped our breathing helmets from our heads. We, we can't breathe! By heck, sir! We can, sir! It's air, sir! You're right, Digby. The air must have fooled our Three. testers. Three. Colonel, sir? Three. Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Three. We saw a tall figure that at first looked not unlike a man. But the face was that of a reptile. Green. The eyes cold as ice. Black as a shark's and with as little feeling in them. The mouth tight, thin, cruel. I wonder if he knows Morse. I never took Venusian at school. Colonel Dare. 
Spaceman Digby, I presume. How on earth do you speak English? We have studied the Earth for 26,000 years. Every dream child knows all its languages. We have humans to check with. The blue men came from Earth thousands of years ago. An experiment. Now, turn round. We have something to show you. Behind us on a large stand was a three-dimensional screen. Held in the middle of the screen, Pierre's space shuttle. Just on the edge of the danger zone. Hank, let's hope we are right about the radio. You ready, my friend? Go for it, Major. Good luck and happy landings, Pierre. Well done. We have a welcome for you. First, you can watch your friends die. They won't die. They're not going to hit your ray shield. They don't have to. They are heading for the flame lands. Flame lands? Our planet is divided into two by a molten belt round the equator. For centuries, we have had little contact with the south. Your friends are heading for the molten belt. I'm sorry. My fault, old friends. Interesting. No fear. Yet you have not yet conquered pity. We waste time. You will be sent by Electrosender to Mekonta, our capital city, for your special welcome. Part one of Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Mick Ford was Dan Dare, Terence Alexander Sir Hubert, Donald G. Digby, Zela Clark, Professor Peabody, William Roberts, Hank, and Sean Barrett, Pierre. Other parts were played by Paul Downing, Christopher Good, John Moffat, Ben Onwukwe, Dale Rapley, Charles Simpson, and Simon Treves. Music was composed and played by Wilfredo Acosta. Technical presentation by Wilfredo Acosta with Michael Etherden and Colin Guthrie. Dan Dare is directed by Glyn Beerman. The second report of the Venus expedition, compiled from black box recordings, personal tapes and Trideman discs. The expedition to Venus had begun disastrously. Our efforts to find food and farming land to feed planet Earth seemed doomed. Digby and I had come through the barrier shield raised by some alien force on the planet, only to be captured by blue-faced humanoids and handed over to their green lizard-like rulers. While we were electrosent 10,000 miles to their capital city of Maconta, out in space, Hank and Pierre were heading for trouble. Dan Dare, pilot of the future. Dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Part two, Divided We Fall. We were flying straight down into a Texas barbecue. 
A flame belt a mile high spread around the middle of Venus, and already the front dome of our ship was beginning to melt. Pull out, Pierre! Pull her up! Get the nose up, damn it! I had no wish to be a rib of beef. Swing her up! Give her the gun, man! Wow! That was a narrow shave, friend. Meanwhile, on Sir Hubert's shuffle... Hand me the helm. I'm in command here, Miss Peabody. Switch the gyro stabilizer. Start the reactor jets. You'll answer for this later, Miss Peabody. On Venus, Digby and I were looking over the glass domes and walkways of the huge mechanical city of Maconta. Buzzing sky scooters, roadways and electrosender tubes crisscrossed the city. My orders are to take you to the director of the Earth Research Center. Orders? Whose orders? You will go by flying chairs. The city's internal transport. How can we? Daft, I call it. Daft. Daft. When? Now. These flying chairs are controlled by thought impulses. Hardly suitable for such puny brains as yours. I will direct all three. You will get on. Why, hey, Colonel, I never thought I'd see the day. Ooh, oops. Hey, hey, hey. Look at this, eh? <laughs> no hands, eh? <laughs> At that moment, the chairs veered to the right and zoomed down into a cavernous building. We were marched along a corridor, and... The Earthmen, oh, Director. Good. Spectro analysis first. The experiments are ready. Green auras. Just string them along. See if we can make a peaceful arrangement to send food to Earth. We are official envoys. I demand to be taken to your chief officer, your president or prime minister. You mean the supreme scientist, the illustrious first one of Venus, the Mecum of Meconta. Right, the gaffer. You insects. You would not even be allowed in the same building as that magnificent brain. Master, a third rocket is about to land on the northern fringe of the Flamelands. We have no need of any more specimens. Fasten them to the slide and give the first injection. One is a woman, O oh Master. A woman? That will be interesting. We will watch them as they crash. Monitor the sound waves and the brain pattern from our specimens. Patch it through. Hurry. We can't pull out. I can't pull her out, Sir Hubert. I can't control. I'm sorry I said some harsh things, Miss Peabody. You're a damn brave woman. Maybe we'll come through. If we don't, we gave it our best shot. Hold tight. Uh, oh. Uh. Sir Hubert. Sir Hubert. Are you all right, Miss Peabody? Uh, we're dented. But still airtight, I think. Is your observation hatch still clear? Yes, we seem to be in a sort of... A... Look, Sir Hubert, ten degrees starboard. What is that? It looks like... like glass, molten glass. It seems to be moving. It is moving. I don't like the look of it. It's moving towards us. We sat watching Digby and I in front of a tri-dimensional screen. Behind us, the tall, green, lizard-faced trees. By heck, sir, will you look at that? It's a moving mountain. It, it, it's coming closer to them. Don't let them see your concern, Digby. These green-faced so-and-sos will love that. Love, Colonel? Love? It is something we do not understand. We have spent generations without feeling. We are scientists. Feelings like fear and love and hate we do not understand. That is why we want you to watch your friends. They are going to die. We will observe you as you watch them on the screen. Is it pity that we are registering on your thought patterns or fear? What are you doing, Sir Hubert? Fasten your helmet, Miss Peabody. I'm going out to Recky. Wait here for me. I'm coming with you. You will not leave the ship. That's an order, Miss Peabody. Good luck, sir. Chin up, eh? That's it. 
Now then, I'll check the outer structure. Fins retracted and undamaged. Shield shows signs of overheat on entry. Check the jet, Sir Hubert. I have emergency state on each of my control panels. It's damned hot out here. Uh, right, jets. Both clogged. It's as if they've been sealed. It's a sort of hardened plastic, almost glass. Could we use the jets to get clear? Miss Peabody, if we use the jets, the whole ship would explode. Hey, hold on. Oh, my God. Oh, oh no. No. Sir Hubert? Sir Hubert? We are registering something here. Anger. You could stop this. You could help them. Save them. Why? I do not understand. They are at great risk. They could die. We shall learn much if we let them die. They have no hope of surviving. If I could get out of this chair, I'd show you what we think of that where I come from. There's a lady there in danger. I'm sinking, Miss Peabody. I'm sinking into... Miss Peabody, help me. Help me. Hold on. Hold on, sir. Catch this rope. It's tied off to the hatch frame. Pull yourself up, sir. Pull. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Well done. Now we have little choice. If we try to lift off, we will blow ourselves to bits. If we stay, we will either suffocate as we sink or roast from the heat. Oh, don't look now, sir, but that glass mountain is moving towards us. What? Meanwhile, I had to find a way to persuade the experimenter to let us rescue them. You were supposed to have the good ideas, sir. How can I? They have no understanding of pity. To them, it's just another experiment. How right you are, Colonel. We could use two for dissection if we had them all. Dissection? Hmm. Very well. Colonel, you are anxious to rescue them. Do it, and we will be able to advance our knowledge even more. Come along, Colonel. You have little time. We can't do it, sir. If we rescue the prof and Sir Hubert, we take them out of the frying pan into the fire, so to speak. We can't let them fry, Digby. You will go by telesender, Colonel. Happen it was us that was in the fire now. There were several long tubes against one wall, and they were sort of pulsing with light. You will step into your tube. Here, chum. You'll not see me in one of them things. There is no need to tremble, spaceman. Who said that about trembling? I just like my feet on terra firma. Simply get in your tube. You oh. will simply be disintegrated Did in the tube. I don't think I want... Transmitted by radio and reassembled in a similar tube at your destination. It's all very well for you, son. Up and I'm not built for radio waves and transmitting and such. Digby, remember... They are sinking into that boiling glass mountain. Aye, and I'm about to, too. Here, don't shut me, you great twit. Here, don't get me wires crossed. What's that funny noise, sir? I don't like this. I've got what's going on here. Digby! Digby! Why are you standing on your head? Come out of there and sort yourself out, man. Technical hitches do occur from time to time. But why is it always to me? We were taken to a gallery of space vehicles and land transporters. The Flight Museum, Colonel. Are they all in flying condition? Intergalactic flying machines are kept in new condition by the airlock. Hey, up, sir, how about that? It's a beauty. A helicopter, sir. Perfect. It might do the trick, Dick. Jet-propelled copter, obsolete for 1,000 years. We took it. They fitted fluorine sprays to neutralize the silicon mountain. Digby clambered aboard first, and we had our next surprise. <laughs> Who the old lad are you when you're at home? I am Sonda, your pilot. Try no silly tricks. We are ready to go. Stand by. We headed due south out of the huge hangar, up out of a volcanic crater and fast towards the flamelands. A race against time. Meanwhile... Professor, have you ever seen anything, heard of anything like this glass mountain? Never, Sir Hubert. Anything in its way just gets sucked under. Still, 
Well, there's life, there's hope. You're a very brave woman. Oh, Sir Hubert. I never had much experience of females, tell the truth. Damn good show, if you see what I mean. Damn good show. Meanwhile, as we headed due south with Sondar at the controls, Digby had a thought. Sir, in being about 10% taller than us, with the gravity differential, it should make us about the same percent stronger. Er, uh, know what I mean, sir? Shh, shh, Dick. Hold your horses. We have to get the others out of trouble first. Just watch how he handles the ship. I'll try and make friends. Ah, uh, fat chance, sir. My Auntie Anastasia would have had a word for him, sir. Uppity, sir. Uppity. I can try. Um, we haven't been properly introduced yet. I'm... Uh... I know who you are, Colonel. I told you my name is Sonda, and you will obey my orders. I see you are extending your hand to me. We have always thought shaking hands illogical. An old customer, a friendly gesture. Usually employed by businessmen and politicians when they are about to cheat one another. Sit down, Colonel Dare. Any luck, sir? He's about as friendly as a frisky stoat. We are approaching the silicon mass now. Sir, look, sir. Where that outsized mint umbug's leaking over the sand, sir. Poking out, sir. It's the ship. The silicon will cover them in the next few minutes. You have little time to get them. You seem concerned all of a sudden. Our experimenter wants to use them. My orders are to bring them back. Yours, to obey me. We will see what our fluorine spray guns can do. We looped round the edge of the advancing mass and Sondar hit the firing button. The fluorine seemed to fill the charged atmosphere below with a fine mist and released the death grip of the silicon mass. Below us, waving up from the rocket, were... It's them! They're alive! We have done it, Digby! Damn good show! I happen it is. Just one thing, Colonel Dare, sir. They're on a sinking rocket, surrounded by some hot liquid stuff, and we're up here! Rope ladder. Part of the kit. I checked before we left. All we have to do is to pay it out to them! We winched down the ladder and Sonda held the copter steady as a rock as the Professor and Sir Hubert clambered on board. Oh, Dan, uh, my all is wonderful. Where the dickens? You can open your helmets. Everything's laid on, including air. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Colonel. Just in time. Oh, golly, Dig, you've yeah. no idea how glad I am to see your happy, smiling face. Oh, no, it's not exactly Freedom Hall, as you might say, miss. Oh, why? You might even say you're out of the fire and into the frying pan, in a manner of speaking. What are you talking about? Him, sir, at the controls. And his little friends back home, sir. Call themselves trees. What did you mean about the frying pan? Not the sort of tact, be His friends, sir, boffins, run wild, quite inhuman. They have no emotions at all. Then are we prisoners, sir? Just for the moment, at least the trees think so. So what do we do about it? Now you and Miss Peabody are here as reinforcements, I'm going to take executive action. Do nothing so foolish. Your intentions are quite clear to me. Your thought processes clearly transmitted. You are quite powerless. Quite, quite powerless. I don't think so, chum. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> oh, well done, sir. Here, down we go. Ladies on these. Kitchen where? Controls, kick me! Give Sir Hubert a hand and drag our tree friend out of the way! Right, sir! Very well. Let's get out Come of here, here fast! How is he? Coming round, I think. I'd like a crack at him, sir! Sorry, Dick, you take over the controls while I keep an eye on him. Right, sir! And change course, old boy! We're probably flying on an automatic radar beam controlled by the trees in Maconta. Aye, aye, sir! Heading now, due south. The wind's getting up, sir. Dirty weather. Change bearing, due west. Will do, sir. It's a twister, Dan. A huge tornado force on the starboard bow. Ahead, Dan. Another tornado. It's moving across. A... It's heading us off. Uh, west, Dick. I uh, can't, can't, sir. 
there, there's oh. another twister there. Oh, we're being shivered like sheep. Well, they're all round us. We can't take this old bucket oh. into any of those winds. They're running at hundreds of miles an hour. Clear to the north. Tree oh. handy work or I'm a Dutchman. So, we turn north, we'll make a dash for it. Your train friend's away, Dan. Ask him which we should do. Sonda, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. You want to know which way to head? Yes. They want us back at headquarters for experiments. Us? You as well? I was afraid. I was afraid when the ship was in danger. I displayed emotion. I'm scientific. They will want to face my fall. We're in the same boat. Oh! Oh! That does not matter. I will be proud to serve Trim Research. Yeah, I'll give the research program a miss, I think. Head to South Dick, into the tornado barrier. Here we go! Oh, 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 professor! Oh, oh. We're being sucked in, sir! I, I, I can't order! I, I can't! Oh, oh. We're, we're going down! Landed in. I've seen nothing like them, not even in the Congo Delta project. Quite outside my experience. Colonel Dare, I'm going outside. Oh, be careful, Miss Peabody. I'll be fine. Jungles are nothing to worry about. Oh, the branches are like rubber. Soft. Fantastically strong. Oh, that's like landing on matches. We were very lucky. Call this luck, sir. Yeah, I ain't creepy crawlies. Yeah, up and I'll stay in the helicopter if you don't mind. I have never seen a jungle. I will expand my information. Very useful. Science is knowledge. Knowledge is science. Oh, I happen it may be. Oh, my, the... Oh, the hammers of hell. That's the biggest, creepiest. What is it? I don't know. But I think I'd rather be in the open than trapped in here with it. After me, Digby. Oh. Oh. <laughs> What's so funny, sir? <laughs> you three exiting double quick. Well, there was a well, a, a, a thing in there, see? It come in through the hatches. Sundar, we're in this together. I want no trouble from you. They will have us marked down. They will be sending guards to take us back. Then we won't hang about here. You all fit? Yeah. Sir Hubert Prof, have you any weapons with you? Uh, we have our paralyzing pistols, that's all. Right. Mm. Dig, got the infrared compass? Uh, yes, sir. We needed to make the rendezvous with Hank and Pierre. If they're still alive. If they manage to crash outside the flame belt, they will be. Take more than a green tadpole dressed in a copper wire corset to finish off Hank and Pierre. Ah, it can't be hotter in the flame belt than it is here. It is 690 degrees and 90% humidity here. The flame belt has no humidity and a temperature of 2,000 degrees. Come on. <sighs> I know one thing. They give a few pounds for this weather in Wigan Wakes Week. Hey, up! Wait for me! Meanwhile, back on Earth... This is the International Headline News, brought to you courtesy of the mineral drink that cuts down hunger while it alleviates thirst. The fate of the three shuttle rockets from the mothership Ranger is still not known. They cut off all radio contact in order to get through the shield round the planet Venus. There is still no news of space veteran Sir Hubert Guest. Radio silence blankets Dare's rockets as Mothership Ranger returns to Earth. Interviewed in her West Street home, Mrs Digby, wife of Albert Digby, spaceman first class, said... He's got true Lancashire grit. The lad'll be back. He'd best be. He's got me and five kids to be responsible for. Across the world, tension mounts. Rioting is reported in Peking. Ration cards were not delivered to five million people. Emergency measures are being taken to preserve strategic supplies of food around the world. Senator Hartwell of North England called for a UN inquiry into the activities of Vitamin Eats Incorporated. He accused them of using inferior quality... Food rations in America and Europe will be cut to rebuild reserves. That's enough of that. I've heard enough to last me a lifetime. And what did you mean about our Albert having a responsibility? Ah, well, he does, Auntie Anastasia, he does. I told his mother when he married you. I told him when he brought you round. I said then you were not right. He's got adventure in his soul as our Albert. I'm proud of the lad. And you are. But he still has me and the kiddies to feed. And he has. 
And you know as well as I do that our Albert's sitting somewhere with his feet up and a nice bacon sarny or a chip butty to hand. He's had the luck of the Digbys all his life. I know Albert Fitz, William. He'll be snoring in peace and comfort, I'll be bound. <laughs> oh, by heck! Oh, thump! Oh. oh! We slashed and struggled our way through the dense jungle away from our crashed copter. We had to avoid the Treen guards who would be after us and try to make contact with Hank and Pierre. If they had survived. Oh. It's hopeless, Professor. We're never going to get through. Wait! What is it? Shush! Listen! To the right. It's a river. If we head for it, we may find it easier going. Follow me! Oh, oh Blitz! Oh. The oh. Quick! So you oh. Oh. pistol! Hurry! Oh. Here, oh. Sam, take it! Oh. Oh. Have you ever oh. seen anything like it? It's the biggest snake. It, it must be 30 meters long and, and that's My strange. family has this thing about worms. I never went fishing as a kid because of them. And, and look at that. Oh, oh, I feel a bit woozy. Anyone oh. seen Sonda? Oh. Oh. Over here. Under this fallen tree. You're right, Sonda. You can come out now. It's safe. All frightened again, were you? Hey, bit of a washout for a train, you. But it... Uh, oh, so daisy. Oh. I do not understand why you save me. We do not understand unscientific actions. Sonda, you may have forgotten it on Venus, but there are other things in life besides applied science. And we may need your help. We must get to the Professor's River and across it if we can. So, come on. Hurry. <sighs> Sir, look, sir. What the? The Zoms. The what? The guards have brought the Zoms with them. Zoms tear their targets to pieces. Oh, they oh. are trained to destroy. Oh. Now you can be afraid. Oh, by heck. Then oh. let's oh. hurry. Oh. Uh. Uh. We came to a vast wall of water, maybe a thousand feet high, pouring down into a huge, dark hole. I've heard of Niagara, but this is balmy. Oh, those zombies are getting closer. Digby, stop chatting and get on. We have to climb those falls, all right? Aye, uh, sir. No time like the present. Might as well get going. Oh. 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 Bailers like Colonel, uh, I could do it here, break. Come on, Dig. A oh. bit more effort will take us to the top. Are oh. oh, we nearly there, Dan? Near enough. Oh. The old boy was feeling his age, and Dig is no greyhound. If only oh. I knew where the trains were. The oh. zombies are getting closer. Oh. Oh. Hurry, Dig. Oh. So you must your right. Yeah, don't worry about me. Oh. 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 We reached the top of the falls and had time to see below us a vast open stretch of pale green water, an inland sea, and then... Dan, behind you! Jumping jets! Slimy! Dozens of them! Green so-and-sos! They were standing looking down at us from the rim of the falls. It is useless to fight. Sonda, you will be most interesting for our scientists. A stream with emotion. Fatal. Straight at him, gang! Come on, the fleet! <laughs> For a moment, it looked as if we might win. But then Digby got in the way of a gun that sprayed him with a sort of plastic balloon. <laughs> You're right, Digby. <laughs> and the trees released a zomb from its leash. I faced the fat fly. Two serrated tusks on its forehead. It was like a cross between a, a Rottweiler, an Alsatian, and a Dingo. I rolled with the animals. It sprang from my throat and hoofed it over the edge of the falls. Sondar, giving as good as he got, was eventually covered with a plastic balloon. Dan! The professor! Out of my firing line! I KO'd the tree who was menacing ah. Professor Peabody. He fell backwards and Sir Hubert's stun gun took me full in the chest. Ah. Dan! Oh, my hat! Dan, get back from the edge! Dan! He fell, twisting and turning as he went, paralyzed, into the white, foaming water below the fall. It was all over then. 
The trains cocooned us all in eggs of clear plastic and prepared to take us away. It is unfortunate we lost Colonel Dare, but he will never return. Take them! This is Sir Hubert Guest's diary tape for the file and report to the UN. I had killed Dan, I knew that. So when they led us away in our plastic bubbles to the city of Maconta, I was not really taking much in. Digby was kind. You couldn't help it, sir. Dan would feel more pain. I wish I could say the same for our prospects. Digby, the professor. You are now ready to help our scientists. Old Earth custom. Ladies first. I'm not afraid of you. I do not understand. Afraid? The frightful chap went to the professor with a ray gun in his hand. Oh! The disintegron is the only way of cutting this plastic. You will not try to escape again. No one tried to escape. Sondar did his best. Good chap that he was turning out to be. Meanwhile, in a vast audience chamber, high above our cell. The Earth creatures and Treen Sonda are prisoners, O oh Greatest One. The fourth is dead. An accident! An accident! There are no accidents in a scientific state. Destroy that guard. <laughs> No failure in a scientific state. Science is all. Bring them to me. I will conduct the final dissection. They will learn that the Mekon of Mekonta, the supreme brain of the universe, will never fail. There will be no defense for Earth when we decide to destroy that miserable planet. Bring the prisoners to face their master. The Mekon speaks. In part two of Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty, Mick Ford was Dan Dare, Terence Alexander, Sir Hubert, Donald G. Digby, Zela Clark, Professor Peabody, William Roberts, Hank, and Richard Pierce, the Mekon. David Googe was Sondar, Margaret Courtney, Aunt Anastasia, and Shirley Dixon, Mrs. Digby. Other parts were played by Vincent Brimble, Paul Downing, Stephen Garlick, Dale Rapley, and Danny Schiller. The music was composed and played by Wilfredo Acosta. Technical presentation by Wilfredo Acosta with Mike Etherden and Colin Guthrie. Dan Dare is directed by Glyn Dearman. Report three of the Ranger Venus mission. The situation was desperate. Earth was starving. Overpopulation, bad farming, greed and pollution had destroyed much of the good farmland. Our mission to Venus, to find new places to grow food, was in a perilous state. The trains held Professor Peabody, Sir Hubert and Digby. Hank and Pierre were lost in the flame belt that surrounded the middle of the planet. This report has been created by taking voice prints, tridiments and black box recordings from all who came on the journey to Venus. Sir Hubert Guest's diary continued. I will never forget the scene at the falls. As a train moved to attack Miss Peabody, I fired my stun gun and at that moment Dan stepped into the line of fire. For an instant he tottered on the edge of the falls and then turned and toppled down into the depths, lost. And we were taken by a train guard for merciless dissection by the supreme scientist of Maconta. Dan.
Dan Dare, pilot of the future. Dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Part three, the Mekon. In here. We demand to be treated under the rules of the Geneva Convention. There is no convention here, Sir Hubert. Forget it, Sir Hubert. That was based on care and concern. These treens neither know nor care. I understand you are trying to insult me. It will not work. You should be honoured to be going to the presence of the Mekon himself. Honoured? Why? He may have you dissected, oh fat one. The others will be tested, investigated, maybe laser operated. Oh. For the good of science. Dissected? That's what they do to coconuts. No dig. Desiccated is coconuts. You will wait here until the Mekon is ready for you. Meanwhile, under the swirling waters of the falls, I was still able to think, but not able to move my body. The waters churned and whirled and finally threw me into a long tunnel. I had to break surface or I would drown. <laughs> Thank heavens I can move again. The paralysis is, is wearing all I can. Oh. I must stay on the surface. Oh, it's so dark in this town. So dark and cold. I must have passed out. The next thing I knew, I was being gently washed against a rock ledge. And ahead of me, there was light. The end of the tunnel. I crawled onto the ledge away from the frightful dark water and towards the light. I checked my compass and knew that without a doubt, I had been swept under the flame belt that cuts Venus in half. The Southlands were bathed in glorious sunlight. Huge red and gold flowers, outcrops of purple grass lay over the rich dark earth. I drank from a clear water stream, washed and set off across the wide open countryside praying the natives were friendly. Meanwhile, my poor friends were facing the all-powerful scientist, the Mekon of Mekonta. I have been studying the situation. Your foolish colleague, Colonel Dare, is now dead. You have no leader. You are entirely in my power. His head was huge. The carapace containing his brain three times the size of a human's. His eyes, cruel, cold, black as night and unblinking. He sat on a small flying platform from which came a throbbing noise. His body was stunted and his legs too thin to support his huge skull. Cutie looked on his flying trolley. As jolly as a stork, we are rabbit. Come over here, my... What is the word? In walked a train in full protective gear, plus a rebreathing apparatus. I see you understand. Go. I tell you something for nothing. They'll be wild about them in Wigan. Very clever indeed. Naturally. Now, we are going to use you. 
be useful in the final stages before we invade planet Earth. Invade? We need to know the extreme limits of human resistance. Then, we shall extract your brains for further study. Sonda, you intrigue us. A Treen who has somehow mutated wrongly. We have looked into your parentage, your history. It is not clear yet how the mistakes can have happened. We will later personally direct your dissection with the laser scalpels. I am at the command of science, Omicron. Meanwhile, far to the south, I found myself in the main square of a vast city. A humming, vibrating city, without a single person to be seen. I climbed to the top of a tall stone building. Looking out, I could see far away what looked like irrigation ditches and fields. There had to be people, inhabitants somewhere, or why bother to irrigate fields and grow crops? I headed for the open country. A harvester bailed the crop automatically and tipped it onto a series of automated moving platforms which headed away into the distance. Nothing to lose. Go for a hayride, Dan Da. Ah. Two hay bales, and that's as good as any bed. Right then. Oh, call me with a nice cup of tea at ten, Stuart. The self-propelled trucks carried me across the hills and valleys of southern Venus over bridges and through tunnels humming along with its load of farm produce. I went to sleep and nearly died as a result. At its destination, a metal-toothed grab loomed over the bales of hay. What the dog? That was a narrow squeak. Hi, Earthman. Who the devil are... You speak English? We have two other Earthmen in our house. What? You won't tell my father I was at the transporter junction. He says it could be dangerous. He's right. Look, I need to meet these other Earthmen. I can take you. Come with me. Thank Pierre. Mon oh, brave. Oh, mon Jim. colonel. Oh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> Incroyable. Mon vieux. Where are the others? How did you get here? We thought you were dead. What happened? I told them all I could. Hank and Pierre had crash-landed just south of the flame belt, and even as we spoke, their shuttle was being repaired. They introduced me to Volstar. He was a leader amongst these trusting and generous people called Therons. They were like us, apart from their deep desire for gentleness. Aggression for them did not exist. We had despaired of you and your friends, knowing that you had landed in the north among trees. We have not been in contact with the Treens for centuries. The flame belt has kept us apart. We are worried to find you have managed to pass through the flame belt. Now defences against the Treens will not stand up to their sophisticated weapons. I didn't come through the flame belt, Volstar. Then I how... came under it. How in hyenas? Under? How? I was carried by a subterranean river. It is very important that you meet with our leaders. As soon as possible. I understand the situation on your home planet is desperate, Colonel Dare. We need help. We need space to grow food for Earth. Here, perhaps. That will be for our parliament to decide. You will be seeing our president, of course. We must hurry. I have two urgent tasks. Fix up a supply of food for Earth and rescue my friends from the Comte. Three, Colonel. We have heard via our radio satellites that the Mekon plans to destroy Earth. Certainly. Mm. Someone has to get back to your mother ship to warn your planet. Your shuttle rocket, Pierre? We'll be ready in a few days. These guys may have given up living in cities or being ruled by machines, but they sure know their way around with a monkey wrench. Volstar, I must talk to your president now. My house is already traveling towards him. Your house is what? Since we gave up cities as unsuitable for man to live in, we have houses that will move where we want them to. It's more convenient. At the moment, we are traveling at around 800 of your Earth miles an hour. The air bubble that surrounds us ensures no discomfort. And while we traveled, Volstar told me something of the tragedy of Venus, of Earth, and of Atlantis. He told of the Theron attempts to pacify the Treen reptiles beyond the flame belt. 
When the gentle Theorons realized that all the Treens cared for was power and science, they left them to their fate. The Theorons explored space, found planet Earth, and discovered a landlocked valley, the center of Earth's civilization, Atlantis. Tragically, the Treens followed them and systematically transshipped the Atlanteans back to Venus, where their descendants have been slaves ever since. The remaining Atlanteans, blaming the Therons, sabotaged their remaining spaceships. They smashed the housing over the atomic reactor engines. The result was catastrophe. The end wall of the valley collapsed as the Atlantic Ocean engulfed Atlantis, destroyed a civilization, and created the Mediterranean. A people destroyed, save for the sad prisoners of the Treams whose descendants are the blue slaves of Maconta. Meanwhile, in space... This is Mothership Ranger calling Earth. Come in, Earth. Over. Will it take long, Sparks? No, sir. I'll put it on boost. Do you think we might get back by Christmas, sir? I had sort of promised my kids a trip. If they say stay, we stay, Sparks. Just think about the Colonel and the rest down there on Venus. You think they're still alive, sir? This is Earth. Do you read, Ranger? Over. We read and have message. Stand by to receive. Go ahead, sir. This is Captain Hunter. There is no sign nor sound from the D.A.R.E. expedition. Rations aboard are low. Can only remain in orbit one more Earth month. Orders, please. Over. What about the others, sir? You know the score, Sparks. No place to spend Christmas Eve, is it? 150 million miles from home. This is Space Control. Abandon waiting orbit. Return to Earth. Repeat. Ranger Mothership to return to Earth. Meanwhile, in the beautiful tree-filled courtyard of the Theron's president's house, I tried to persuade the old man to help me go back into the north to rescue Digby and the other crew members. Naturally, we grieve for your friends, but there is little we can do to help. I can't just sit and grieve. These people rely on me. You cannot pass through the barrier erected by the trees over the flame land. And you'll do nothing. Hey, come on, man. Don't get too heavy. We have achieved the perfect life here. Happiness and peace for our children. We mean to keep it. And the rest can go hang. The trees are planning to attack Earth, and you just sit back and enjoy your music. Great. Yeah, Pity is fine. Grief, too. But if you let the trees commit crimes you are able to stop, then they become your crimes, too. You sit here and read poetry and smell flowers while our Earth children are starving to death. You would sit here listening to music and, and talking to your wives while our wives are being butchered by trees. Some civilization you have. Damn. Yeah. Cooling. President Kalon, I apologize. No, no, no. I am shamed by what you say, Colonel. We will do all we can to help. Meanwhile, in Maconta, Dig and Co. were suffering terrifying endurance tests. I've told you. I was born in Wigan, and I know folk there will not stop fighting because you turn up. Why? If they know we can kill them all... Why not just give in? You'll not understand, son. Pride. You can't frighten me with dentist drills or whatever that is. The genetic pool is such that man seems to have created many differing versions of himself. You trains have only clones of each other, true? That is more efficient. Maybe, but for a scientist, random ideas can sometimes lead to exciting results. You understand? I must ask the Mekon to talk with you. I do not understand. You can question me till you're blue in the face. It doesn't change the fact that the Earth will go on struggling to survive whatever you may think. Free and not as slaves. Then they will be totally deleted from the universe. Meanwhile, south of the flame belt, we were busy. Are you sure you can do it alone, Colonel? I can, if I can go back disguised as an Atlantean. So what are these Atlanteans like, man? I'll try and describe. No, there's no need. We can make tridemen with your help, Colonel, with this telepathy helmet. This what? If you will put this helmet on, Colonel Dare, 
and bring into your mind your memory of one Atlantean. Fine. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Just concentrate and remember. Look, it's you. Look, in the corner. Look at that. A blue man with a... He's got a gun. It's all right, Hank. It's just a part of the Colonel's imagination. An Atlantean soldier. Thank you, Colonel Dare. C'est alors. It has just melted away. Formidable. Dan, are you all right? Fine, fine. That blue skin. Mighty pretty, Dan. And the bulge on the forehead. We can use that bulge to solve a problem. We have a scientist standing by to make necessary changes. If you have the courage, Colonel Dare. Try me. Lie down, please. Under the lamps, Colonel, it is here we will make the cosmetic changes. When we saw the Colonel next, he was a changed man. Different clothes, different skin, blue as sky. Then they turned up with a pièce de résistance. This wig has a large bulge at the front that enables you to speak and understand the Atlantean language. The headphones, receiver and unscrambler are built into the bulge along the hairline. Try it on. Oh, very well. This is great. Yes, I think this wig is probably terrible and tricked each other, God. Fantastic! <laughs> Affreux, mes braves! He is a blue man. He speaks their language and he looks formidable. Now what? The search party has found the entrance to the underground stream. They are already widening it to get a team through. Oh, there is no time. I have to get through now. We know that, Colonel. We have taken from our stores an underwater craft perfectly designed for your needs. Electronic navigator, radar net for cavern navigation, rebreathing gear, autopilot. Queries? How long can it stay under? Ten Earth hours. Its range will take you well clear of the flame belt. All checks are now completed. Good. Is the slipway clear? All clear and ready to go, Colonel Dare. You have your personal breathing apparatus on board. Right. Um, before you go, Colonel, we have this weapon to offer you. Treen technology depends on magnetism. This is a demagnetizing gun. It has not been tried on trees, but we felt it might work. It is the best we are able to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Au revoir, mon brave. See you all in Piccadilly. I don't mind admitting that for a limey, Colonel Dare had guts. He locked himself in that submarine-type contraption as if he was going for a spin down the Delaware. Good luck! Once down the ramp and into the street, I turned on the autopilot. Right then, uh, George. I hope you've got your master's ticket. We're on our own. Red day. What? Red day. Oh, <laughs> right. Uh, now, find the forward scope, check out the channels, and then talk course changes into the auto. George, uh, are you still there? I'm a bit confused. Yes. Well... <laughs> Channels and course already sorted. Radar operative. Auto changes locked. Fine. Level off in centre of stream and go due north against the current. Full speed ahead. Hank. Pierre. I've just heard that your shuttle is repaired and ready for firing. Great! We need to make visual contact with Ranger. Tootsweet, as we say. There has been a homing device fitted. It will bring you safely back here if you cannot contact your mothership for any reason. We were ready and on the launch site in no time. Motors, go. Seals, go. Retros, activated. Go. Comes internal systems, go. Okay, man. Let's burn some juice. Rocket takeoff from Southern Hemisphere. Tracking devices activated. Check all screens. Inform the Mekon. Inform the Mekon. Inform the Mekon. Inform the Mekon. Alert all tracking devices. Check contents of rocket. Check trajectory. If necessary, destroy it. 
now under flame belt, 200 miles from estimated discharge point. Thanks, George. Check the forward screen. A huge shoal of fish, the eight to ten pounders. They'd feed a few thousand back on Earth. Approaching a mass, living across whole channel. Orders, please. George, I'm... Um, Orders, uh... please. Mass appears to be animal of some sort. Orders, please. It's... Orders, it's please. a huge squid! Orders, please. We're heading straight for Orders, it! please. Increase speed! Agreed. We have armaments. To your left, red button. Rest now for auto-guided aqua rocket. Red? Now. Fire now. Fire now. Fire now. Rocket away. All clear. Reducing speed to safety level through debris. Stay on auto. Hours later, we emerged from the tunnel. Now hear this. Now hear this. Steady, George. In that periscope. Hmm. Nightfall, as for schedule. Of course. We have a problem. George! Waterfall dead ahead! All right, all right. Don't panic. No problem. Fasten safety harness. Activate all green modules. Huh? What? What on earth? Joystick now activated. Press flight button on top center to avoid all. Button pressed! Oh, wow! You chaps think of everything! We flew out of the water and climbed to the top of the falls. As we appeared over the rim... Searchlights! Crash dive, George! George, dive, dive, dive! Continue tracking the rocket. Course takes it over flame belt and on a northern orbit. Dispatch space interceptors. It's an Earth craft. Destroy it. It must never reach Earth. Destroy it. Ranger, this is Shuttle 3 calling. Come in, please. Ranger, this is Shuttle 3. Do you hear us? Over. What the luck? Hell and Harry, where the blue blazes did that come from? Three of them, Pierre. All around us. We have no chance. Climb, Pierre, climb. Uh, that one's got us locked up. Hey, we are gone, my friend. I can't avoid. I am jammed. Controls are jammed. He was on top of us. What happened? The Therans have put a shield around us. They must have. Zap the home and switch, Pierre, and let's get out of here. Uh, we... It's not fair. They just crash into our shield and boom! The last one's heading for home! When that ship returns, execute the pilot. I said no Earth rocket was to escape. This is aggression. There is no truce with the Therons. We are at war. Meanwhile, under the water, I left the craft on the floor of the lake and using my personal rebreather, made my way to the surface. Once out of the water and away from the watering holes of the huge reptiles that lived in the wilds of the Treen Hemisphere, I dumped the underwater kit, changed into the blue man's costume, put on the translator wig, and, using an old map provided by one of the oldest theorons, headed towards the Atlantean Reservation. Down below me in the dark night lay the sparkling lights of a small Atlantine village. Here we go. I'll switch on the translator and see if I can get by as an Atlantine surf. I crept closer to the center of the village. An angry meeting was going on. Amazingly, I could understand everything the Blue Atlanteans were saying. 
The younger men were facing what was clearly the village council. One of the young men was speaking, angry. We know Urtag, our headman, is wise and careful, but the time has come when wisdom's not enough. He grows old and his blood grows thin. This is the time for action. They're taking all our young men for the army, and we know who'll be the first to die. My men die for trees. We have no quarrel with the men beyond the flame land. If we must die, let it be as free men. Not as slaves for trees. Our faces be ground into the dust. An old man stepped forward. Don't listen to him. I beg you. Three times our fathers have revolted, and three times we have been defeated and punished. We can hold on to our dreams of freedom. But we must have patience. We have no weapons, no machines. We'll take them. Wait, my children, wait. Who's there? Who's there? Come out. Boys, I see a stranger. Who's there? Get a brand from a fire. Come here, stranger. Hold him. It's a spy. Spy. I'm no spy. Why did you not blow the horn by the sun god's gate to announce your arrival? I, I'm sorry. I am a hunter from the other side. Oh, 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 He's a trained spy. Yeah. 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 Hold him. Children, wait! Children. If he tells the Treens about this meeting, we're done for. Hang on the execution tree! No worm is lynching me! Take that! Come on, man! I don't want to fight you, but... No, no, you don't! I lost my translator wig in the struggle. Suddenly, I could understand nothing. Then, they stood back from me raised their arms and began to cry out. In part three of Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, Dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Mick Ford was Dan Dare. Terence Alexander, Sir Hubert. Donald G. Digby. Zela Clark, Professor Peabody. William Roberts, Hank. And Richard Pierce, the Mekon. David Gouge was Sondar. Ben Onwukwe, Volstar. And John Moffat, Kalon. Other parts were played by Vincent Brimble, Christopher Good, Brian Miller, Dale Rapley, Danny Schiller, Charles Simpson, and Simon Treves. The music was composed and played by Wilfredo Acosta. Technical presentation by Wilfredo Acosta with Michael Etherden and Colin Guthrie. Dan Dare is directed by Glyn Dearman. Report 4 from the Ranger Venus mission. Compiled from personal black box tapes, tridimens, and voice prints. Earth was in peril from famine, and the Ranger mission had been sent to discover possible farming sites on Venus. The planet would have been perfect, except that a race of reptilian cruelty, the Treens, was ranged against a race of gentle and thoughtful people, the Theorons. I had volunteered to rescue three of my crew. Disguised as a blue Atlantean, slave of the Treens, I had ventured into the Atlantean Reservation. Cargas! 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 Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future. Dramatized for radio in four parts by Nick McCarty. Part 4, Battle Station. The Atlanteans raised their arms in salute. One of them returned to me my wig with a built-in translator, which I had to wear to understand their speech. Stranger, forgive us. You are welcome here. We have things to show you, things to explain. 
Come! We went into a long and old stone building. You see here uh, an ancient hero, dead many centuries. A forgotten art was practiced then to preserve the body. Standing in a dark alcove stood a man of about six foot, dressed in loincloth, carrying a spear, and only the palest of pale blue. He lived and died a free man. The trains never caught him, and our legends promise that one day he will return to lead us to freedom. There is one thing that marks him out from us. His forehead has no bulge, like mine. Kargaz was his name, and you carry it now as well. He was old Earthstock, as you must be. I am. Tell me no more. For us, you are Kargaz. You will help us win our freedom. And you can help me release my friends who are prisoners of the Mekon. We will try. The trains are coming. They round us up like animals. Make us fight people we have no fight with. It struck me that joining the Trin's army might speed up my getting to Mekonta. Meanwhile, in the Mekon's audience chamber... Remove the shield over the flame belt. Yes, Omicron. Send Omicron. reconnaissance planes over Theron land. Yes, Omicron. Make the reflector spacecraft ready for takeoff. Prepare for war. Trine stormtroopers marched us Atlantines to the nearest police post, and from there we were herded into electro centers. They transported us to Meconta. We were taken to the barracks to be kitted out. An old sergeant major spotted me when I was first ready and waiting. Hello, hello, hello. Who's this then? You there? Stand up when I talk to you, you horrible little man. Do you know who I am? I am the cohort depot in chief. And you, you horrible little... I know a reservation lad when I see one and you are not one of them. Who are you? I had no option. I briefly lifted the front of my helmet. What? Well, I... Cargas. Will you help me to the last drop of my blood. I've prayed all my life that you turn up. Just give your orders. Meanwhile, in the Mekon's audience chamber... We have observed you Earthmen to be stronger than we thought. Oh, Eck, I'd love one of Auntie Anastasia's aspirates now. We have found a way to defeat your planet without giving ourselves too much trouble. You are mistaken, sir. Humans are emotional to the point of weakness. We have ways of playing on that. You will help us. We will not. Never. I think you will. Count me out, you stinking old toad. Hear me. I, the greatest, the all-seeing and all-wise, know how to defeat these zeros. We will send a ship to Earth with pictures of the prisoners, as if injured on landing, but now being looked after. They will make a recording telling their fellow men how good and kind we have been. We will promise those fools on Earth food, but first we will tell them we have to build a transfer station on the moon. And then we will have our telezeros installed. And the Earth, with its great magnetic fields, its minerals and its industries, will be ours to pluck. Its population, our slaves, we will rule the universe. You're barmy. You will pose for some pictures, record your messages, and then you will be spared to work in the mines at our North Pole. I can smell rats at you, but close by. Green, nasty, and putrid. Words, Digby, do not hurt me. Now, we will put Miss Peabody into the gas chamber. Eh? And you may watch her slow and excruciating death on the telescan. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. You swine! Hold on a minute, sir. A, a message you said to home? Yes, I want to tell Auntie Anastasia how much I miss her. Deeply, I order you not to give it. We don't have a chance for Hubert. And Miss Peabody might be gassed. Then he winked at me, old Dig. Something was going through his mind. I wasn't sure if I could handle it or not. So Hubert refused to talk to me. 
In his eyes, I was a traitor, and I could hardly explain there and then what I was trying to do. Meanwhile, unbeknown to us... Left! 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 Halt! Position of first degree! Move! Good! Good! The day one in chief was a typical sergeant major on the face of it. Curling moustaches, blue face, almost purple in parts. The bulging forehead of the true Atlantean Venusian. His priestly forefathers had taught him English. I did my best. While the old boy drilled me, his son checked the whereabouts of Sir Hubert, Digby and Miss Peabody. Position of alert! Good! We'll make a soldier of you yet! Father... I've found the Earth prisoners. They're done for, I'm afraid. Having heard what his son had to say, the old boy charged across the parade ground and assembled his men. On that double! I will call you Dan, your Earth name. The dreams will have you locked up double quick if they hear the name Gargas. Now, if they take your people to the pole, as my son says they will, they'll never be got out of the mines, never. But the trains will want an escort for them. Now, fact one. You have recorded the message for your Earth parents? It's not my parents, Mekon. Me auntie. I, I, I've got it written down here. Let me see. I've done what I was asked. I've told them that the others were not yet well enough to send a message. But they were being well cared for. I, I, I did everything you wanted. Yes, yes, I can see you have. I like the intimate touches. Enjoyed the day out in where? Uh, sunny mouth. Seaside place. Yes, yes. Add his message to the photographs. Yes, oh my God. Commander, First Army, you are ready? Yes, oh Mekon. As soon as I land on Earth with the messages, I will report back by teleview. Good. Bring in the prisoners and prepare special escort for them. The others came in from their cell. No one spoke to me. It seemed as if they hated me. You have been saved by the actions of your black friend here. You will not die. Digby, how could you? We have no wish to betray our Earth. You will be sent under guard to the North Polar Mines and live a few miserable years there. Never let it be said that the Mekon does not keep his word. Special escort reporting for duty, oh Mekon. Take these away. Standing right beside me was a tall, blue-faced man I could have sworn I knew. Then he winked at me. Damn! Colonel, sir! Escort, take them. We're not moving. Very well. You have disobeyed the Mekon. That is enough. I'll waste no more time. Kill them! I flicked the safety catch off the weapon I carried. Ready, Bluebirds? Now! <laughs> I blasted the floating platform from under the big-headed Mekon. He fell to the ground and hadn't the strength to get up. I grabbed him and put my gun to his head. One move! One move and I'll kill him! Oh, Run out of the train guard! Lock him up! In that room at the end! If it is secure! There is no time for explanations! Oh, they they you know the way around this insect's fun palace! Get us out of here! Quick! This way! We ran out of the chamber and along a steel-lined corridor. No one tried to stop us. Nothing moved. We turned a corner and then... Door 77A closed. Monitor them. They have the Mekon. The next Mekon is still a pupa. We cannot let him die. It will take 50 thanets before our next Mekon is prepared. Isolate them at the top of the building. Televiewers on all corridors. Go right, Dan, and up the stairs. We can't go up much, much further, Dan. Well, there's only this gallery. Hey, look at that. Hey, hey, just a thing for an escape party. Flying chairs, a ferry bicycle park. Can you work those things, Dave? Thought control, too powerful. The Mekon could if he woke up, but he'd direct us straight to the nearest lockup. Can you fly these bikes, Sonda? I will do my best. Well, no one will dare attack us while I have the Mekon under my arm. Come on! Oh, 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 I have to have help. You must all concentrate. These work on powerful thought waves. I need help to deal with all these spikes. 
Are you ready? Okay. Remember, Dan, keep the mick on asleep, or his thought power will shatter my grip on the machines. We set off from the bike park out over the city of Maconta. We got you look sweet, sat on a seat of a bicycle made for two. Me, what have you got to sing about? You betrayed us. Me, miss, you better look in the following wind. If they do deliver those messages, my auntie is going to smell a rat. You'll see. Look out behind me! <laughs> They were coming at us mob-handed, a complete battle squadron. Cease this foolishness. You are surrounded and have no chance of getting away. You fly away, sunshine. If you don't give us a clear sky, I'll snap this Wonder Boy's neck over my knee. It worked, Dan. They're sharing off. Sondar was magnificent. He managed to hold us on course to the space station and the waiting rocket ship. No one gave us any trouble there once I held up their meek on by the scruff of his chicken neck. It was easy, and like a fool, I lost the advantage because it had all been too simple. Hey, what the? Mekon had been waiting his chance. He flew the bike away from the space station and the rocket ship on the launch pad and out over the purple lake with me still on it. No way could I override his massive brain power. You see, Colonel Dare, too, can play the hostage game. I can sling you off, you little pipsqueak. Do that and the bike will deliver you where I have reset it to go. My guards will kill you so exquisitely and your friends will die too. They can take the rocket. They won't. They are human, so loyal, pathetic. They will try to rescue you. I have a small surprise for you, Mekon. A present from the Theorons. A demagnetizer. Can you swim? You think I have time for foolish sports? Too bad. I press the button on this and the bike will fall out of the sky and into the lake. It destroys the magnetic field. What's your brain going to do about that? Here goes. You fool. Ah! It works! It got the motors great! The Mekon! The Mekon is back! Or you will drown! They picked up the little insect and then turned for me. Death rays churned up the water around my head. I died. It was time to use the Theron demagnetizer again. They were too busy trying to save the life of the Mekon and themselves to bother much about a lone bike dropping down towards it. Yeah. Sonda, you old beauty! I grabbed the trailing edge of the bike and Sonda steered it ashore. Well done, Sondar. Very well done, old chap. Now, come on, my party. They'll be after us double quick. So, into the spaceship. Chop, chop. Sondar said he could pilot the Telezero reflector ship. It was the Mekon's secret weapon against the Therons and a major coup to capture one. Meanwhile, south of the flame belt, Hank and Pierre were itching for action. Mon Dieu! It is time we did something, Egg. We cannot just sit here. President Kalon, any news of Dan? Nothing. His submarine is still on the riverbed sending out transponder signals. No more. You got any spare fighters, Mr. President? I can spare none. Oh. None even to escort you all back to Earth. We have to try all our rays on the trees. They have nothing as protection against them. Mr. President, we have word that there is a Telezero reflector ship in the Treen fleet. It can deflect all our weapons. If they use that against us... Important screen 7, sir. Yes? A Telezero reflector ship is preparing to leave the contest, We sir. have to destroy it at any cost. Meanwhile, we were battened down in the Telezero reflector ship on the launch gantry. The Mekon was throwing everything he could at us. Cable systems in go condition. Thank you, Sondar. Activator circuits. Release pads. All circuits holding. 
As fast as you can, Sondar. Scientific control is necessary at all times in launch mode. They cannot hurt us through the tele-zero screen, Colonel. Absorbers off. Blue code number? Four red. What? Four man on the red paddle. What on earth? They're attacking the supports. We have no time for checks. Button black code one on purple panel. Check. Fired. The Mekon continued to pour fire into the space station below us, killing thousands of his own people without a thought. We were happily riding into danger as Sondar boosted speed and shifted our trajectory. So the Telezero beam is powerful? Deadly. Its only weakness is that they need a platform in space from which to reflect it, as it only travels in straight lines. But the Telezero ship, that, gentlemen, is probably indestructible. We are in great danger. Somehow, we must blast it out of the sky. Fight us away, sir. Meanwhile, we began to prepare for the attack we knew would come from the trees. They, after all, had the Telezero weapons capable of doing the business. Battle stations, everyone. Best of luck. Do what you can, Sonda. I will. Here they come. Dream fighters dead astern. <laughs> Pilot officer Nagel reporting to fear on President. Treen fighters attacking Telezero ship. Treen fighters fighting their own people? Pull the other leg. Hey, hold on, no. Here, my friend, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Dan, right. Dan, Dan. Got to be, don't you see? They are fighting to stop their ship leaving, and who would take it? Dan, Dan. Come on, man! Come and get it! I'm running out of ammo! Just take one out from me, Sir Hubert! Hit in rear section. No leaks. Small panel ripped and buckled. No protection there from Telezero rays. Evasive turn to right. Look! There are planes. Different planes and closing fast. What are they, Dan? The armed squadron four approaching target. You have to call them off, sir. For Pete's sake, call off your fighters! I'll do better than that. Control to Fighter Wave 1, President Kalon speaking. Orders cancelled. Reflector ship believed carrying Earthman Dare. Engage and take out train fighters. Orders received and understood. Great stuff, Prezi, old boy. I want to take a fighter. Go and bash a few noses. Come with me in the command ship. You beauties! Crazy devil waggling his wings at us. Keep your mind on the job, boy. The best sight I've seen in a long time. Go for him, Theron! Come on, you lord! Come on, you Theron's! Ah! Ah! Safe on that! All right! It's malfunctioning. Don't worry about it. Put out in place. Circuit 10 in overdrive. Commander, assist crippled Telezero ship. We will take our occupants on board. Fear on fighter wave six, take out any stragglers and then act as rear guard. They're running! The trains are running! Beam Commander Tagor reporting, Omicron. You faulty, unbrained fool. You should have kept a reserve. Get out of here and destroy yourself, Chancellor. Omicron, we have every power source channeled into building up the Teddy Zero power chain. We will blast their nests and their earth friends to dust before it does them any good. Do it! Meanwhile, in the Theron Space Command vehicle... Where's the Dapon? He stayed in the Telezero ship when we abandoned it. He took over the controls from Sondar. That is so. But he was wounded, badly wounded. Look, look on screen two. What is he doing? He's turning the reflector ship. He's realigning it. Oh, no, 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 he can't... Contact him! Make contact! All contact cut. He knows, as we do, that the Telezero ray comes from one source, and he is going to destroy it. But he, he'll... he's such a nice old buffer. Dapon pulled the reflector ship on course and threw the wrecked machine straight at the building housing the Telezero transmitters. Oh. It was great. Magnificent. I'll go to the foot of the ice. end of the Terra Zero for some time. And the end of a very gallant gentleman. Japon's brave action meant that the Treens would be no threat for many years to come.
We Theorons owe you a deep debt, Colonel Dare. We understand that planet Earth has grave problems. We agree to help feed the people of the Earth on one condition. You said nothing about conditions before, Mr. President. We will work on transporting food from southern Venus to Earth, providing there is a guarantee from the people of Earth that they will promise to take better care of the resources they have left. Time could run out again if they do not, and even our supplies are finite. We will need that promise. I think, Mr. President, that there will be no problem with that. Then please join in the Theron feast we have prepared for you. No vitamin pills, Digby, I promise you. Bayek, will you look at that spread, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, sir, an urgent message from control. Hmm. Gentlemen, I am sorry to say there is a problem. The Treens are reported to have sent a battle fleet on a heading 87 degrees by 52. Direction... Earth. The Treen's first warship and reconnaissance flight headed across space for Earth, while Theron experts struggled to get a ship ready to take us home. We were too late. Everyone wanted to believe the Treens. This is the English section of the World News, broadcasting to you on the BBC. The Venusians, who call themselves Treens... Reassuring messages recorded on Venus by the Ranger crew under Captain Dare have been brought by the Treens. The World President is speaking at, at this... At this historic moment, signing a treaty with our friends from Venus, in which they agree to ferry food and material to Earth as soon as they have set up a receiver station on the moon. And we are broadcasting for the first time the message from Spaceman First Class Digby. Hey, the trains are a grand lot. We are in an oxygen room in a fine hospital looking out over a beach. It reminds me of our hotel room on that holiday we had in Sunnymouth, Aunt Anastasia. Do you remember? What? In May, wasn't it? Eh? That's it. May Day Sunnymouth. What? Hey, it is like Sunnymouth here. Fiddlesticks! By heck. Phone. Give us the phone. Police. That message from Digby in space. Poppycock. I want a word with the chief. Young man, I can have you out of your job in a time to say night. Now, jump to it, Sonny Jim, or else. He didn't know Aunt Anastasia, nor did the people at Space Fleet HQ. Who on earth? Aircraftman Digby's auntie. You the manager. I am Colonel O'Reilly, Supreme Commander. The message from my Albert was a fake, was a warning. The Treens, or whoever they are, are deceiving you. Now, madam, I hardly think you could know. I brought Albert Fitzwilliam Digby up from the age of five. He was only once in Sunnymouth, in October, not May. And he hates the place like poison. Have a newspaper cut him, we'll tell you why, here. Mistaken identity, Albert Fitzwilliam Digby of West Bank Wigan, released from custody, held for a week as man police have been searching for, suspect in the Hammersmith murder. He was in prison, accused of murder all the time he was in Sunnymouth, wrongfully, and not May either, all wrong, a warning of some sort. May? May Day, he said. May Day. May Day is the international call sign for emergency. Sonny Mouth, wrongfully imprisoned. You're right. I know I'm right. Albert Fitzwilliam Digby is no fool. He knew I'd sort it out. Get me the PM. And a detachment of the International SAS to be put on full alert. This is Dan Dare calling Earth. This is Dare calling Earth. Are you receiving me? Over. Oh, you stig. We'll just have to try and speed this old ship up somehow. No chance of that, sir. Dan Dare. Who's that? This what? is Earth. Listen, what? The world president speaking. <laughs> we have just Sick. eliminated the three menace. Hey? Thanks to you and your man, Dick. Hey! hey. Oh, hey. Congratulated <laughs> on his warning. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> all a huge get. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Over and out. Digby, 
We have done it. Aye, oh, good old Auntie Stacey. Eh? Auntie? <laughs> oh, forget it. Have the fear on to help feed the Earth's great work. I think we might say mission accomplished, sir. Goodbye, Mekon. Hello, Earth. Oh, I know what I fancy, sir. I know too, Dick. Fish and chips and a nice long sleep. sleep. In the final part of Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, dramatized for radio by Nick McCarty, Mick Ford was Dan Dare, Terence Alexander Sir Hubert, Donald G. Digby, Zela Clark, Professor Peabody, William Roberts Hank, Sean Barrett Pierre, and Richard Pierce, the Mekong. <laughs> David Googe was Sondar, David King, Dapon, Brian Miller, Ertag, John Moffat, Kalon, Margaret Courtney, Aunt Anastasia. Other parts were played by Vincent Brimble, Tara Dominic, Andrew Downer, Elizabeth Mansfield, Dale Rapley, and Danny Schiller. The music was composed and played by Wilfredo Acosta. Technical presentation was by Wilfredo Acosta with Michael Etherden and Colin Guthrie. Dan Dare was directed by Glyn Dearman.